Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. Blessing once again to be with you as we prepare to embark upon our final topic together as a church congregation. For those of you who will also be attending uh, the series and who have been attending uh, thus far, just wanted to once again give an invitation to please come back out uh, for our final topic for the series tonight. And that is going to be tonight at 6.30, the final rise and fall of the King of the North, from Daniel 11, 40 to 45, the final events of Bible prophecy. Tomorrow we'll be having a wonderful service also at uh, Brother Verdusco's homes, Brother and Sister Verdusco, as we enjoy seeing the, jo- the join and the union of holy matrimony between our brother and sister Jason and uh, Crystalyn. And so we're very thankful for that. Amen? Amen? And then, of course, also just wanted to also announce briefly Monday evening, will be our final topic on uh, Adventist history that we've been dealing with over many of the Sabbaths, and that's going to be Monday at 5 o'clock, right here as well. Correct, brother? And we'll be dealing with the scattering and gathering of Israel, the 2520. We'll be dealing with that on Monday afternoon at 5 o'clock. We, by the way, just wanted to announce we are going to have two different series available. One is going to be the DVD series for this evangelistic series that has been going on over the last month, and you can ask Brother Abraham for those. There'll be a second series on, on uh, uh, topics for Adventists, and that has been dealing mostly on the Sabbath. We've been dealing with timelines and things like this, and the Monday will be the very last one. As we prepare to get into our topic today, I'm going to invite you to please turn with me <clears throat> back to our scripture reading this morning, which was from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, once again, as we look at God's standard for the Christian church. And today's topic in our main service is going to be dealing with Christian standards and the prince and guiding principles in adornment. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 14, and when you have that, please, once again, friends, just let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, Father in heaven, once again, please bless your holy word as we study and read together in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or Satan? But what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The Bible teaches that we have a high calling as Christians. Amen? The Bible calls us a holy people. And we're commanded in the Bible to be holy because God is holy. And as we deal with this topic today, I believe, friends, that the world has dressed itself up in garbs of Christianity and has walked into the Christian church. And I believe that as Christians, we have a high calling to be different, to speak different, and to look different from worldlings. Matter of fact, the Bible says it like this in the book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter chapter 2 talks about the fact that God has called us to a high and a holy calling. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 9, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, in dealing with the fact that we are a holy people, a peculiar people, that we should be different from the world, that we have been called out of the world. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and when you're there, once again, please let me know by saying amen. And the Bible says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a what? A holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Bible teaches that because we have been called out of the world, that we should be 
different from the world. We are a holy people, amen? A peculiar people. People should be able to look at us and recognize that we're different. Something is different about us. Matter of fact, God says that we should be holy because he's holy. Just look at the previous chapter in chapter 1 and verse 15 and 16. 1 Peter chapter 1 also in verse 15 and 16, dealing with the fact that we're holy people. And the Bible says, but as he, matter of fact, pick it up in verse 14. Verse 14 says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or behavior, the Bible says. Verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy, for one, I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Friends, the Bible teaches that we are to be a different people than the world. And the Bible teaches that we are living in the last days. How many of you believe that we're living in the last days? And for those of us who are living in the last days, we are also living in the last church of Revelation chapter 3. We recognize that we have the seven churches, and we are living in the time period of Laodicea. And Laodicea means a judged people or a people living in God's judgment. And I want you to notice how God describes the condition of Laodicea today. Matter of fact, notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation the third chapter, and we're going to look at verse 14. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. And friends, when you get there, once again, please let me know by saying amen. And the Bible says, friends, that Laodicea is a people being judged, and Jesus is just about to spew this group of people out of his mouth. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, I wish, he says, that you were cold or hot. So then because thou art what? Lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me, what? Gold tried in the fire, that's faith, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that's righteousness, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And the Bible says, friends, in verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Notice the condition of us. And this is dealing with all of us as a people. The people living in the judgment that we are rich and increased with goods and believe we have need of nothing when we're poor, blind, miserable, wretched, and naked. And I believe, friends, that Jesus today wants to clothe us with something, and that's called his righteousness. Can you say amen? Now, as we look at this, friends, it is important to understand that God has standards in the Christian church. And when people recognize that the Seventh-day Adventist church is God's remnant church, that the end-time church has to have standards, amen? I mean, I mean, the church has to be different from the world, correct? Now, what is the issue of being lukewarm? But when you notice that if you have a glass of water, and you put some ice cubes in it, and you pour some nice water in there, and it is really nice and crisp and cold and refreshing on a hot day, and you place that on your coffee table in your living room, and you walk away for maybe five hours, and you come back, is that water going to be cold anymore? No. Now notice this, friends. If you put on the table a glass of ice cold water and a glass of boiling hot water, and you still leave it on that table all day long, they're going to be the same temperature. It's going to be called what? Lukewarm. Why is it lukewarm? What has happened to the temperature of that, of that drink? I want to know if somebody can, can follow my train of thinking here. What has happened to it? Yes, it's become lukewarm, but why? But why did the temperature change? In other words, it adjusted to its environment, right? So when God says that the church is lukewarm... It means it's not on fire, it's not cold. It means that it has adjusted to the worldly environment around it. Are you with me, friends? 
And the condition in the church today, whatever denomination you claim to be a part of, you'll notice that most churches in the world tend to be like the world. Matter of fact, today it seems like evangelism is no more about preaching the gospel. It's about having rock and roll concerts and having clowns and mining festivals to get young people. We say, to get young people in the church. And people say, well, you know, we need to do it for the youth. No, friends, the youth will never be won by foolishness. The youth will be won by Jesus. Amen. I was 21 years old and locked up in prison with tattoos all around me, and Jesus won me not by rock and roll and not by people coming with sagging pants on trying to say, hey, homie, get your life right with Jesus. They, Jesus dealt faithfully with my soul and taught me that I was lost and needed to be saved. I was blind and needed to see, and the blood of Jesus washed me clean. Can you say amen? And youth friends, let me tell you something, young people will not be won to the gospel by foolishness and by the world. The church will never win the world like that. The world will always win the church. And one more thing as well, friends, and never forget this, that whatever you win people with, that's what you win them to. So if you win people with low standards, people come in and they recognize low standards. But if you win people with high standards, you may get l less people, but you'll get quality people who really want to serve and follow God. And what's better, friends, a huge church, a mega church with 30,000 unconverted people bickering and fighting and committing adultery? Or a little small church of maybe 10 or 12 that are serious and can turn the world upside down for the God of heaven? How many people did God use in the beginning? 12 apostles and another few up in the upper room. Amen. And this small group of people, because they were faithful, were able to do damage to the kingdom of hell because they were right with God. Can you say amen? Now let's move on, friends, because as we look at Christian standards in the church, I want to tell you something, that only holy people will go to heaven. How many of you believe that? Heaven's a holy place, amen? And only holy people will go to a holy heaven. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, friends, notice what the Bible says. I want to challenge the church today to make sure that we're walking with God in every standard that we know to be right. Amen? People say, well, wait a minute. Is God going to destroy me because I'm just holding on to this little sin? The bottom line is, friends, that sin is sin. Sin is sin. Can you name one sin? Can anybody here stand up and name one sin, big or small? Even the, can somebody name the smallest sin that God is going to allow into heaven? Which one? A white lie? Borrowing something but never giving it back, which is stealing? Gossiping spiritually by saying, oh, you know, I, I think that the standard should be, oh, oh, this person, oh, blah, blah, oh, let's pray for him. That's called gossip. And gossipers will not be in the kingdom of heaven either. What sin will God allow in heaven? Which one? None. The Bible says, friends, that we must be holy people to enter into a holy heaven. And the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, notice what the Bible says, and friends, I know that I may make enemies today, but that's okay. I have a friend named Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 3, notice what the Bible says, and if I make enemies, I, pr I pray that you'll love me anyway because I love you, and I believe that God wants us all to go to heaven. Amen? So I'm just going to be, by the grace of God, just going to just say it like it is, and if people have a problem with it, then please take it up with me afterward, and let's go to the Bible to study this out. But friends, let's just go and see what the Bible says today. Amen? Second Peter chapter 3. I once heard a preacher say that when people preach sermons, they should preach to one person. That's the God. In Second Peter chapter 3, notice what the Bible says in verse 10. Second Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 10, that we must be holy people, friends. Are we all there? Let's say amen. Second Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 10, the Bible says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which the heavens shall pass away with the great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all what? Holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Friends, this is the place where we want to go, amen? And we know that the Bible teaches that we are to be called saints, amen? Now let's move on because we're going to look at the fact that God has called us out of the world, and God wants us to be different from the world. Now, the Israelites... 
When the Israelites were called out of bondage and they left Egypt, they were called, that was a type or a symbol of God's people being delivered from the bondage of sin or the bondage of the world. Amen? And the Egyptians had learned many things that were not according to God's standards in the Bible. And they had to be re-educated. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches that even Moses, when Moses had to flee, you all remember that story, don't you? When Moses killed the Egyptian soldier, remember that? And he fled, and he was found by the, by, by the well in Midian, and some ladies came up to him, and, and he helped them to get water. You remember that, don't you? And they came back and told their father-in-law, Jethro, and they said, hey, an Egyptian helped us today. Moses had learned to dress like the Egyptians while being in Egypt for 40 years. And God had to re-educate him in the wilderness to no longer look like the Egyptians or look like the world, but to look like God's people. Now let's move on, friends. I want to move on to this because he recognized, friends, that as we speak about proper Christian attire, as we speak about the way that God has standards in our lives, in the way that we dress and adorn ourselves. Now, no, this is not, I'm not trying to put some kind of oneness standard and say, yeah, we all have to wear some kind of, some kind of purple garment. That's fanaticism, friends. But there are Bible standards of modesty and simplicity in Christian dress. Now, notice what the Bible says. The main thing that we must be clothed with is the garment of Christ's righteousness. Amen? Notice what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah. What book are we going to, friends? The book of Isaiah, chapter 61. We're going to talk about two things today. We're going to talk about the standards of God and guiding principles in adornment. We're talking about the way that we should look. When people look at us, do we look like worldlings or do we look like Christians? And I believe that there should be a big difference between us and the world. Isaiah, chapter 61, notice what the Bible says in verse 10. And once again, friends, when you have that, please let me know by saying amen. Isaiah 61 and verse 10, the Bible says that this is the most important garment or article of clothing that we should be wearing. Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of what? Salvation. And he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. So what are we supposed to be wearing, friends? The robe of Christ, righteousness. Matter of fact, notice up here on the screen. Notice up here on the screen as well, we look at Revelation 19, verse 8, that the church, this beautiful bride, the bride of Jesus Christ, is wearing something that's beautiful, it says. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Isn't that beautiful, friend? This is the main important thing that we should be wearing as Christians. Amen? As we look at this, I want to notice what the righteousness of Christ is. From Christ's Object Lessons, page 310. By the wedding garment in the parable is represented the pure, spotless, what? Character which Christ's true followers will possess. To the church it is given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The fine linen, says the scripture, is the righteousness of saints. It is the righteousness of Christ, his own unblemished character, that through faith is imparted to all who receive him as their personal Savior. How many of us want that garment? Amen. Don't we want the garment of Christ's righteousness? This is the garment, the robe that we must have unless, unless we be found naked. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches that people will be found naked without Christ's righteousness in the end of time. In Revelation 16, at the close of probation, Jesus says, take a hold and hold on to these garments lest you be stripped naked. Matter of fact, let me show that to you just in case you've never read that before. Revelation chapter 16. Let's go there quickly, friends, as we look at these principles of Christian attire. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. As we continue on in this subject, I believe that the world has walked inside the church in today's day and time. Revelation chapter 16, and notice what the Bible says right here in verse 17. The Bible says in verse 17, actually let's pick it up in verse 15, pardon me, verse 15. Jesus says, behold, are we all there, amen? Behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk, what? Naked, and they see his 
shame. So the Bible says that we need to take a hold and grab a hold of Christ's righteousness, this garment, lest we be stripped naked and people see our shame. Now as we look at this, friends, I want to continue on on this. As we look at the fact that God wants us to be holy people, it says, for this is the will of God, even your what? Sanctification to be holy. The Bible says, continue on, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and the very God, this is the prayer of the Apostle Paul, that the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God wants us to be holy people, amen? Now let's move on, friends, because I believe that the influence of Hollywood has come into the church. The occult influence of Hollywood. You all know that Hollywood is occultic, don't you? We already talked about Harry Potter. Harry Potter, the, 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 the child phenomena, this little warlock, he carries around a little magic wand, doesn't he? And that little magic wand is made out of wood. Does anyone, once again, know what kind of wood is made out of? It's made out of Hollywood. Hollywood, my mother was a witch, and my, I'm not talking about, I'm calling her names, my mother who committed suicide, she was a witch, she was a practicing witch, she was in the occult, I was raised in the occult, I was raised in the new age, I went to an occult church for eight years, psychic fairs, people doing energy balancing, tarot cards, crystal ball gazing, this is spiritual, this is, this is devil worship friends, if you don't believe it, it is. And even people are uncomfortable with this, this is occultic spiritualistic worship. And my mother's name was Holly. And Hollywood is the third most sacred wood in witchcraft. This place called Hollywood, just like Harry Potter's staff made of Hollywood where he casts spells on people, Hollywood is casting spells on the world. And Hollywood is vomiting out filth and wickedness that the entire world is becoming polluted with. You know that, don't you? You know the pornography industry comes from America. And all these other nations in the world, when you go to Asia and, 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 other, and other places of the world, they have little tiny girl prostitutes. And the reason why they raise their children to be prostitutes is so they can make money off the American businessmen who come overseas. They learn this wickedness from Americans. And God is going to judge this wicked nation. You don't believe me, friends? You watch what happens to these cities. and You watch what happens to Hollywood. Do you believe Hollywood's going to take a stand? When the judgments and plagues of God fall, I believe this city is going to be burned up. Now notice this, friends. We look at Hollywood and the influence of Jezebel, the influence of this false church. I want to notice, once again, that there are two churches in Bible prophecy. How many? There are two churches. And notice that this one right here called Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, this woman that was drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, was she a good woman or a bad woman according to that scripture? Pretty bad. Notice what she's wearing. Notice this. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with what? Gold and what else? Precious stones and what else? Pearls. She's wearing jewelry, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And you'll notice, friends, that this woman represents Jezebel, Babylon. I'm going to go back. I want to pause there for a moment. Let me, let me just show you something, friends. I want to say that I believe that dress reveals how closely connected we are to God. Now, you might be saying, well, wait a minute. Well, you mean the way I dress? Am I lost? No, I'm not saying that. But I believe that dress has an implication on your spirituality. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 3. Let's study this out. <clears throat> Pardon me. Genesis chapter 3. Notice what the Bible says about dress, the way that we dress. Let me ask you a question, friends. Can you tell what group of people somebody is in or hangs out with according to the way they dress oftentimes? Yeah, dress is a badge. I used to be a gang member, and there's a certain style of dress that gang members wear, right? Baggy pants and, you know, and, and oftentimes, you know, flannel, flannel, uh, flannel shirts and these things and, and Nike Cortez. You can see how somebody dresses and I, 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 you can tell what somebody is trying to perpetrate depending on how they dress. Does that make sense? Some of you have been in the military. Is there a specific way you dress in the military? Can you, depend, can you tell the difference between somebody who is enlisted military and a civilian? Yes, you can. There are uniforms for officers and for firemen. Can you, tell the, can you tell what department or office somebody is in depending on their uniform? Yes. What about girls and boys today in high school? Now, some of you young people back there who are bowing your heads and falling asleep, let me ask you a question real quick, okay? Let me be honest. 
All right, good, amen. Let me be honest. Now, Chris, you're back there. Let me just call on you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass you, all right? Now, you're in high school, right? Can you tell what group young people hang out with depending on how they dress? Yes. Some are rockers. Others are goth, right? They, what's that? Some are cowboys. Some are preppies. Some are jocks, right? And you can tell what group they hang out with depending on how they dress. Isn't that correct? Am I, am I correct, Megan? You're in, high, you're in school too, right? You're, you're in high school as well. So can you tell who hangs out with who depending on how they dress? However they dress. And some, in school, if you dress a certain way, you're not accepted, right? So the way you dress represents who you hang out with. Does that make sense? Now notice in the book of Genesis that a lack of clothing came because of sin. And I believe, friends, that th there is immodesty in the Christian church today by a lack of dress in the church. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3. And by the way, some of you are going to think, well, am I talking about you, friends? I, I planned on talking about this months ago. So just because somebody may be here and, and getting offended, don't get offended. Ask, ask yourself, is, is God talking to you? Don't get offended and then walk out and start saying, oh, I don't like how he said something. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Go back and see if it's biblical. Amen. And if it's true, and if a duck is a duck, then it's a duck. If it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, then it's a duck. Amen? And if I'm stepping on your toes, then move your feet out from under my, toe, from my, under my boot. Amen? Let's go on. Genesis chapter 3. Notice what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 3. Notice that nakedness and lack of dress came as a result of sin. Notice what the Bible says. Now, before we read this, let me ask you a question. Adam and Eve were created... In whose image? God. How many of you agree with that? We all agree. Adam and Eve, man and woman, were created in God's image. Amen? Now, what does God look like? What is God clothed with? Hold your finger there and go quickly to Psalm 104. What book are we going to? Psalm 104. The 104th division of Psalms. Psalm 104. Psalm 104. Notice what the Bible says, beginning with verse 1. And notice what God looks like because... We were created in God's image. Notice what God looks like in Psalm 104. Psalm 104, beginning with verse 1. When you have it, please let me know by saying amen. We're going to read verse 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with what? Honor and majesty, who covers thyself with what? Light as with a garment. Now pause there. What is God clothed with? Honor, majesty, and with the garment of light. That means when Adam and Eve were created, they were clothed with what? Honor, majesty, and a robe of light. Many people wrongly paint pictures of Adam and Eve stark naked in the garden. The Bible does not teach God did not start a nudist colony. God had man and woman clothed with a beautiful garment and robe of light, just like God wears. Does that make sense? This is why after they sinned, they understood they were naked. The light went out. The light represented the connection they had with God, the righteousness of Christ. Does that make sense? Notice what happens as a result of sin in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6 and 7. Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Are we all there, friends? Amen. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And then look at verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were what? Naked. Now what did they do to try to cover up their nakedness? It says, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves what? Now let me ask you a question. So now here happens, they sin. The light blinks out, and they're naked, right? How did they try to cover themselves up with a, with, a, with, a, with a garment of a what? Fig leaves, and it made themselves apron. How many of you ladies uh, uh, cook in the kitchen? Anybody cook and have aprons? Amen. More, good. More ladies raise their hand now than in Sabbath school. What does an apron look like? I know my wife has some. My wife makes them. What does an apron look like? An apron comes usually around right around the neck, a little string, and it covers just right over here, right over the chest, comes right like down, right about to the thigh, right? And the entire back is open, correct? So when it says that Adam and Eve wore apron, Adam and Eve, that was that Adam and Eve were the inventors of the first miniskirt. 
You think I'm joking. Isn't that what an apron is? They were exposing their limbs. They were exposing their back. They were exposing their backs. Like, may I ask you a question? Isn't this the fad and the fashion of today's style of clothing? Show just about anything off? It is a result of sin and a lack of a connection with God. What happened when Jesus forgave them? I want you to notice this. And take down notes now, friends. Whenever Jesus forgives somebody, he also clothes them. Did you get that? When with forgiveness comes the clothing of two things. Number one, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness. Amen? But he also clothes us with clothing. And Genesis chapter 3, notice what happens when he forgives them. So they sinned. They're wearing miniskirts. They're wearing aprons. They're naked. And now notice what God does. He forgives them and then he clothes them. Notice what the Bible says now in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 3, 21. Are we all there together, friends? Amen? The Bible says, and unto Adam also and to his wife, after he forgives them, did the Lord God make what? Coats of skins, and he what? Clothed them. Why did God need to clothe them? Because they were naked. They were naked and inappropriately clothed. Now, let me ask you, what is a coat? Now, when you look at a coat in cold weather, you know, like in Russia or those London fog coats, what does it look like? It's all the way down to the sleeves, correct? It covers around the chest, and it goes down to the legs, doesn't it? And so what God did when he forgave them, he also put on them clothing to cover their limbs and to cover up their thighs, to cover up their back, to cover up their privates. And it represented the clothing of Christ's righteousness. Does that make sense now? Let me give you one more example just in case you're not convinced. Go to the Gospel of Luke. And let me show you this, the, the, the condition of a sinful man who was naked and when Jesus forgave him, he put clothes on him. Notice the Bible says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. Some people have an issue with this. because I'll tell you why. Because people have pride and vanity. And I'm going to be honest. Like I said, I might, I might make uh, enemies, but it's because I love you, and I'll be very honest. Women, my sisters, you struggle with this more than men. And many women have a real issue with this. And I talk about this all over the United States, and sometimes women come up to me and say, I have a problem with you. I have a problem. What's, what's the problem? Is it biblical? No, but I just feel like I want to wear what I want to wear. It's pride. It's vanity. And you have to understand, friends, that men and women have been affected differently by sin. Men and women are different, aren't they? And men and women have been affected differently by sin. What happened to woman and what happened to man? Remember, what did woman do? Who was the one who sinned first? Eve, the woman sinned first, correct? And then the woman became a tempter to the man. Isn't that right? And so therefore, God said, man, I want you to be the leader of your home now. Before you were equal, but now because she was deceived, you need to lead your home and not be led by your wife. And I believe that there should be godly Christian spiritual leadership by men in their homes. That does not mean that you trample down your wife. You should be a, a loving priest, a loving servant priest. That means that you serve your wife and love her, and she will want to serve you. Does that make sense, friends? Now, let's notice something. What happened to woman? The Bible said, we already read that, so we're not going to go back there, but the woman, it says that she saw that the tree was what? Good for food. Women struggle more with appetite than men. They struggle more with being good for food. Who struggles more with appetite like bulimia and anorexia, men or women? Appetite disorders tend to affect women because this is how they were affected by the fall. Then she says, it was pleasant to the eyes. Women tend to be more attracted by visible things aesthetically, right? I used to be single, friends. Uh, and I remember when I was single, I lived in a trailer park. And, you know, most trailer parks, mostly just single guys live in trailer parks. So I fit right in back then. And, you know, I used to keep my home really tight. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a clean freak. But I, you know... I remember uh, people walking, it looks like, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Single men, they look like they live in a dungeon. There's, you know, there's, no, there's no pictures on the wall, there's no, you know, there's no beauty. That, I mean, they just, they don't care about that kind of stuff, usually. Women tend to have more of the gift that God gave them of aesthetic beauty. Amen? Women tend to be more attracted to beautiful things. How many of you men love it when another man gives you a bouquet of flowers? <laughs> now, you all laugh, but let me ask the women. How many women love a bouquet of flowers? Because women tend to love more beautiful things. Does that make sense? And so women struggle more with appetite and they struggle more with vanity, more with the fashions. And let me just be honest. If you put me up next to somebody from the 1800s who used to preach, you'll look at himself, you'll look at me, and our styles look very, very similar. They have not changed over the last several hundred years. Women's styles change just about every day, don't they? Going on sale, come get it. It's about to leave because the next fashion's coming in this weekend, right? 
Fashions change all the time. Then the third thing woman struggles with, it says a tree desire to make one wise, and oftentimes women struggle more with pride than men. Now that's not the same type of pride, like male pride. It's more of the pride that women don't tend to get along with each other. Men, we all seem to like if we get along. Even if we don't like each other, we still get along, right? It's like, hey, all right, all right, brother, look. And if we have an issue, you know, we don't, we don't sit here and do this kind of stuff to each other. Like, you know, you know women, do you do this? Right? And the husband comes up, honey, how come you won't talk to sister so-and-so? Because she thinks she's fine. She thinks she's cute. How, she hasn't even said anything to you. Well, she, she's giving off the, the vibe. Don't women struggle more with that? So women tend to struggle more with this issue of pride and vanity. Is it true? Now, I know it's kind of funny. I'm bringing these things out in a, in a real type of way so that you know this is true, right? What do men struggle with? What did the man, when Eve came to him, now notice this, friends. Eve came to him and began to tempt him to eat the fruit, and he chose the woman over God, didn't he? And what is man's weakness? Women over God. Let me just tell you one more thing, friends. This is really deep when you think about it. Remember, men and, man and woman were wearing a robe of light, weren't they? Remember when they sinned, the light blinked out. The robe went away and they were naked, correct? So which one sinned first? The woman sinned, which means when she bit that fruit, that light went out and she was, what? Naked. So when she came to Adam with the fruit saying, hey, Adam, what did she look like? Adam went and he chose a naked woman over God. And man's struggle is with nudity, pornography, sexual excess. Is it true? Is the Bible correct? And so all the devil has to do is work on the weaknesses of men and women. Get the women to be vain and uncover themselves and get men to look at them and fall into lust and sexual sin. Does that make sense? And this is why in the church there is a 50% divorce rate because men and women no longer know how to be modest and reserved and clothe themselves correctly. And in my church... I don't allow that kind of stuff. Now, I'm not some kind of, you know, I just put down a hammer and force people. To, you know, people have their own conscience. But friends, people will be very uncomfortable being in my church. They continue to dress in inappropriate ways and be flirtatious. I will rebuke it from the desk. Amen. Because I don't believe that our young men and young women should be flirting together and spending time together if they're not in a married situation. And they should be reserved and appropriate, upright, godly Christian young people. Amen. Where's the standards in the church? Nowadays, this sounds like fanaticism. There was a time when every church used to teach this. Now let's look at the book of Luke, chapter eight, as we talk about dress, and then we're going to talk about adornment as well. I believe that God needs us to have higher standards in the church of God, amen? We need to have higher standards, friends. Even if this makes you uncomfortable, even if you don't, even if you don't like what I'm saying, I believe that if you're honest, you can agree that the Christian church today must go higher. The Bible says in Luke chapter eight, beginning with verse 26, and when you have it, once again, please let me know by saying amen. The Bible says, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee, and we, when he, Jesus, went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time, and he what? He wore no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. And here we have a man demon-possessed, and he is naked. Remember, sin and nakedness go together. Didn't Jesus say that? Hold on to my righteousness, or otherwise you'll be naked, and you'll, people will see your shame. Now notice, did Jesus cast out the demons out of this man, yes or no? Yes, he did. And notice, once Jesus forgave him, and once Jesus delivered him, Jesus also put clothes on him. Notice what the Bible says in Luke chapter 8, and let's look now at verse 34. Jesus causes the pigs, those swine, to run down off the mountain and to be dead. People say, oh, you know, we can eat anything. If we can eat anything, why did Jesus allow all those thousands of pigs to die? Jesus talked about, don't let the fragments be wasted. Gather up the fish. Gather up the bread. Amen. But when it came to pigs, he didn't gather them together. He said, hey, let them die. You're not supposed to eat those things. He let them die. No, notice verse 34 and 35. When they that fed them saw what was done, 
they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Now notice verse 35. Then they went out to see what was done, and they came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, what? Clothed and in his right mind. May I submit to the congregation tonight, or rather this, this afternoon, that those who are clothed appropriately are in their right mind. Those that lack clothing are not in their right mind. Women are not in their right mind when they walk down the street half naked. You want to know why? Because you're inviting yourself to get raped. Do you know that other countries of the world that where the women tend to dress more conservatively have far less incidences of violence and rape against women? Do you know that? The Western cultures have, I believe it's like a thousand percent more of a, of a, 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 of a, of a statistic of rape and violent attacks against women and it is because it is directly linked with their styles. How many of you have been hearing about little girls now getting kidnapped and raped and killed? It's because of little girls, you can't tell whether they're 12 or 21. Some of these little girls, and I'm going to tell you, you need to dress appropriately. Because otherwise men will look at you and you're inviting danger. Amen. Makeup and short skirts and tight pants. Little girls should not be, and, and, and young girls and young ladies and older ladies should not be dressing in ways to attract the attention of men. Why? If you're a modest woman, you want to attract the attention of Jesus. I'll tell you one thing that attracted my wife. My wife, when I met her, she came in and, and I mean, you know, she used to dress the way she dressed. And she began learning about these things in our church years and years ago. And I respected the way she dressed. And one of the way, things that attracted me to my wife was not the outline of her back end and her thighs and her breasts. What attracted me to my wife was the fact that she was a beautiful Christian. And it was the Jesus in her that attracted the Jesus in me. And we got married not based on lust and physical attraction. We got married based on spiritual attraction. I loved her for who she was. I loved her for her mind. And I was attracted to her spiritually. Does that make sense, friends? And as a result, we have a happy, beautiful Christian marriage. Most marriages that are contracted on physical attraction, it dies off. And after a while, the men start saying, okay, you're old now. Where's the next one? You think I'm joking? Is this not true? I don't even want you to raise your hand because there are women in here who have experienced this taking place before. There are perhaps women in here who are divorced because men have ran out and looked at other women because, because after a while, the, the wife just gets old because the, you were attracted by physical attraction. It needs to be a deeper foundation spiritually. Amen? Now let's move on. By the way, I have a burden for young people. Many young people are just blind, deaf, and dumb and just deceived. And I love you young people, but I'm being honest. You're being walking down the wrong road when you get attracted to people because of their big bosom and backside. You're going down the wrong road. You better be careful. The Bible teaches in the book of Proverbs. Let me just show this to you, you two young people. Let me go there. I'm going to my last section in just a moment. Let me go to the book of Proverbs. Go there quickly, please. Like I said, I love you. I'm, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Some preachers, they play games with young people. Oh, young people. Oh, let's play church now. That's, that's, that's wishy-washy, wimpy stuff. There need to be preachers who stand up and tell people like it is. And look at young, and I'll tell you something. Even though young people sometimes get uncomfortable around me. Oh, man, he's going he's gonna to nag me again. Oh, he's going to grab me by the ear. But you know what? I usually have respect from young people because at least I'm a straight shooter. And because I tell people like it is. And you know what? Young people aren't dumb. The devil tells it like it is to young people. Why can't God tell it like it is to young people? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, go there quickly, friends. Young people, you better be careful regarding women that want to attract you. I want to just show this to you really quickly. Proverbs chapter 7. Notice the Bible teaches that women, especially you young men, you young men, you better be careful because loose heathen women are after you. That's right. Proverbs chapter 7. They want to cause you to be lost. And by the way, you young ladies, also young heathen men are going to be after you. You better be careful. You better be a Christian. Proverbs chapter 7. Notice what the Bible says. My son, are we all there? Amen. Verse 1, my son, God is speaking to us as his children. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live in my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister. And call understanding thy kinswoman. Notice verse 5. That they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. 
For at the window of my house I looked through my casement, and I beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man, void, he didn't have any understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, he see, he was trying to be secret. He snuck out of his window. He said, oh, my parents are asleep. I'm going to go to my girlfriend's house. Here's what he's doing. Now notice what it says. And behold, verse 10, there met him a woman with the attire or the clothing of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without. Now she's in the streets. She lies in wait at every corner. So she caught him. She grabbed him and kissed him. And with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face. And I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry. She's seducing him. With carved works, with the fine linen of Egypt, I perfume my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves for the good man. He says, she says, my husband's not home. He's taking a long journey. He's taking a bag of money with him. He'll come at home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool goeth to the correction of the stalks till a dart strike through his liver, and as a bird hasteth to the snare, and he knoweth not that it is for his life. Friends, notice in verse 20. I'm going to finish this up. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she has cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Friends, God does not say anything nice about adulterers and adulteresses. Now let's move on because I'm already going in my time, and I want to just simply close or, 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 or go to my last section, friends. I believe that at, at, when we look at dress and when we look, friends, at the way we adorn ourselves, I believe that we need to have higher standards and clothe ourselves appropriately, amen? Matter of fact, write the scripture down. I'm just going to give this to you real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. I want to read one scripture that has come into the, this has come into the Christian church in contemporary times, and like I said, you may disagree with me on this, but I'm still going to tell you anyway. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. Let me give you this last scripture for this section, then I'll go to adornment for our last section. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. Let me be very honest with you. The lack of modesty in, Christ, in, Christian, in women came during the early 1900s with the women's suffrage movement. How many of you ever heard of the women's suffrage movement? It was called Women's Rights, Women's Liberation Movement. This was the movement that began having women dress more and more like men. They began, it was called the American costume. You can read about this. Women began taking off their dresses and wearing pants and boots and jackets just like men because they wanted to have equal rights. They wanted to vote like men, work like men, and they began to dress like men. Short hairstyles, pants, all these various things. But notice what the Bible says about women dressing like men. Or, or, or women, or men dressing like women. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, The woman, are we all there, amen? The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth Unto who? Unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So according to the Bible, is it biblical for women to dress like men, yes or no? No. Is it biblical for, women, for men to dress like women? If I stood up here as a preacher, and I came out with a pretty pink dress on, and some little bows, would you respect me for me preaching? you think I was a wacko nut, Right? But it seems like women dress more and more like men. Women are wearing suits. Women are wearing pants. And you say, what's wrong with pants? Aren't there female styles of pants? I'm just going to be honest with you. Like I said, you may disagree with me. That's okay. This is, this, is, this is the church. We can agree to disagree. Amen? But the bottom line is, when a man looks at a woman in tight pants, you're still not wearing anything. Remember, what was the, what was the man's sin? Men lust after women, right? And when a man looks at a woman, even though you're wearing Women's style of pants, they can still see your backside, they can still see your hips, they can still see your front side, your private parts. Yes or no? Am I, am I being, am I being, in a, am I being, now you young, some of the young people are right there saying, uh-huh, yeah, that's right, because the girls in school, they're, they're dressing like that more and more. Some of them have to do this to get in, a, am I being honest? Girls have to do this to get in their pants. 
Oh, and they walk like this, and they're so tight, they have to walk down the street like this. Am I being honest? And you think I'm joking, but am I being honest? Am I being honest? The styles are inappropriate for the Christian church. Now let's continue on now, friends. What about adornment? Notice, and I want to talk now about adornment. This is my final section. I believe that we should be dressing modestly and appropriately as Christians. Same thing with men. This is not just a pick on women day. It's for men as well. I don't believe that men should be walking around in tank tops showing off their biceps and their chest and their calves and their legs because women also are attracted to men. And it invites infidelity, does it not? Let's move on. Now what about adornment? Notice in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 22 and also verse 30, that makeup actually came from paganism. Now again, you're going to be mad at me. I don't, I, I'm just going to be a straight shooter. You know, Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I have to be honest with you, okay? You may not like it, but can we at least agree that I have to be honest? I'm just going to tell you that makeup and jewelry came from heathenism. I'm just telling you where it came from. I'm going to give you some quotes on the screen that tells you that rings and all these various things come from paganism. Notice Jezebel. Now, was Jezebel a virtuous woman or an impure woman in the Bible? Which one? How many of you agree? Did Jezebel? Notice this. 2 Kings 9, 22 and 30. So long as thy whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel... And her witchcraft, or something. so does Jezebel sound like a good lady or a bad lady? She has whoredoms and witchcraft. Is that good or bad? Now notice what Jezebel was doing. Jezebel was married to an Israelite king named Ahab. And she caused the Israelites to be overthrown by forsaking the worship of God, and they began worshiping Baal. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, notice what Jezebel does. Jehu, when you read, I don't have time to read this right now, but when you go back to 2 Kings chapter 9, Jehu was raised up by God to kill Jezebel. And you think, well, that's pretty violent. Well, the reason why was because Jezebel was causing thousands of people to die because of their idolatry. So God said, Jehu, go kill Jezebel and get rid of her sin in Israel. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 9. He goes now, Jehu came to Jezreel to assassinate her, and notice what Jezebel does. Jezebel heard of it, and what did she do? She painted her face and tired her head, and she looked out at the window at him. And when you read the rest, she begins to try to seduce him. She puts on her makeup, she puts on her best seductive clothes, and she looks out the window and says, had Zimri peace, he slew his master? She begins to try to seduce him. And Jehu, when you read the Bible, was not seduced. He says, who's on my side? Who's on the Lord's side? Who? And three eunuchs came to the window, and he said, throw that woman out the window. And they threw her down, and she died. And she trampled upon her with his horse. He killed this woman. The reason why was because her profligacy was overthrowing the Israelites. And notice that she was the first one that we have in the Bible that put makeup on. She, now, am I saying that you're a prostitute if you wear makeup? No, I'm not saying that. I am saying, however, that God did not make you with makeup. The word makeup means to make up something, Right? It means make-believe. And I'm going to tell you something very honestly. Some, many, many ladies are getting more sick because of their makeup. And the reason why, I'm going to be very honest with you. You may not want to hear it, but I'm going to tell you. Does anyone know where the base for your makeup comes from? How many of you have ever, some of it is pork, it's true. Some, how many of you have ever been driving down the road and seen a dead animal on the side of the road? Anybody ever seen, you see them a lot out here in the, in the, you know, in the, in the country. The animal, the dead animals... One of two things happens. Either the buzzards and the scavengers come and they eat it. Otherwise, if it's in the middle of the road and it's causing a delay in traffic, they call up the, you know, people like the ASPCA, they call up the uh, trucks to pick up and scoop up the dead animals, right? And what they do is they actually sell these dead animals to what are called rendering plants. Does anyone know what a rendering plant is? A rendering plant is, is basically a plant where they boil the carcasses of dead animal roadkill and other things like, uh, like uh, farms where pigs and cows have died, and they sell them for a profit. They boil them, and they get the fat from the dead carcasses. They skim the fat off, and they sell this fat to makeup companies so that they can have them as a base for things like lipstick. I'm not joking. You think I'm, matter of fact, where's my wife? Is she back there somewhere? Is she back there somewhere? I just want to just ask her to come here. I want to just make sure that you see I'm not, I'm not joking. All right. I want to ask you a question. There's my wife back there. Honey, you remember when the pastor who married us told the story about his wife remember, uh, going to the, uh, uh, to the hospital and remember they took her placenta and they sold it? You remember that story right there from the church? 
Can't see you back there. Okay, good. The pastor who married us one day told a story of his wife going to the hospital, and I've been there. My, our last child was born at the hospital, and they take the placenta, right? Now, when we had our little girl at home, we had to get rid of the placenta ourselves. You know, some people go bury it or get rid of it or whatever. But in the hospital, we had, you know, the doctors, they take the placenta away. Now, you're a nurse. You, you know this, right? They do this. Now, this pastor asked the nurse one, he said, what, what are you going to do, you know, with the placenta? And the nurse said, actually told him, I said, well, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but we sell it to the rendering plants. That's right. In other words, the placentas of women are sold to rendering plants, and they take the fat, boil from the placentas, and sell them to makeup companies. So women are putting makeup on their face, they're spreading afterbirth on their face. I'm just being honest. Did you know, how many of you ever heard of Ralph Nader? Ralph Nader ran for you know, president many times. Ralph Nader, the consumer advocate, actually did a report and showed how mascara is tending to cause eye problems with women, that hair dye is causing problems in their, with hair loss, that makeup is actually poisonous. It's full of chemicals. It is not, if God wanted you to look like that, he would have made you with it when you were born that way. And again, it goes back to just being very honest. Oftentimes, women struggle more with this vanity than men. How many men do you know that wear makeup? If you do, then that man has a real problem. Let's move on. Now notice about adornment. In like manner also, this is the scriptures. How many of you want to be Bible Christians? We all do, amen? This is not picking on anybody. This is just simply giving Bible standards, amen? In like manner also that women adorn themselves in what kind of apparel? Modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with the good works. The Bible, the Bible itself says in the New Testament that we are not to wear jewelry. Right there. We're not to wear gold or pearls or costly array. Now, let me give you some scriptures as I start to, uh, just to wind this down. Let me give you a few scriptures to show you where that God considers jewelry idolatry. Go to the book of Exodus chapter 31. Let's go there quickly now. Exodus chapter 31. I want to show you that jewelry is considered idolatry. By the way, friends, I used to wear it. I used to have earrings on my ears. I used to have a ring in my nose. I used to have other types of jewels I used to wear on my fingers and around my neck. I used to even have different piercings in, in other part, parts of my body. And the Lord came to me and simply revealed to me that this is inappropriate. I began reading the Bible and seeing very clearly that this is not, this is not the Christian standard for men or women. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, that jewelry is considered idolatry. Exodus chapter 32 I wish I had more time. Exodus chapter 32, notice what the Bible says. And when the people saw that Moses delayed, verse 1, to come down from the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. So notice now what happens in verse 2. They forsake God and they make a golden calf. What do they use to make the golden calf? Verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden what? earrings which are in the ears of your wives of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me now pause there why were the israelites wearing those jewels where did they just come from from egypt they learned of the worldly styles of the egyptians notice now verse three and all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto aaron and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf and they said these be thy gods O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, go to Exodus 33. And notice now God begins to judge the Israelites, and he says, take off your jewelry. Notice what the Bible says in Exodus 33. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 1. When you have that, let me know by saying amen. Let's move on. And the Lord said unto Moses, depart, and go up hence. Thou and the people which thou, thou, thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, unto thy seed will I give it. And he says this in, in verse 3. He says, I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on him what? His ornaments. Why? Verse 5. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment, and consume thee, Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, 
that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. So God was not pleased with their jewelry wearing. And God specifically said, take it off. Now go to the book of Genesis. I got to start to close up. Go to the book of Genesis now, quickly now. The book of Genesis chapter 35. The book of Genesis, what chapter are we going to? I want you to notice something, friends. I don't have time to go into detail about this, but you can write down in the scripture that Satan fell from heaven because of his pride and vanity. Write that down. Write that scripture down. Write down Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 17. All right? You can actually read Ezekiel chapter 28, and you can read verse 12 down to 17, and it says that in the beginning, when God made Satan, or Lucifer, he was adorned with all sorts of beautiful jewels. It talks about the gold, the chrysanthemum, and the amethyst, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx stone. He was beautiful. He walked around. He was like a walking rainbow. Does that make sense? When you read it, and it says that his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. Satan was the first one who became vain and proud because of his jewels. And therefore, God tells the people of his people, he says, look, so that you don't get lifted up like Satan, just take them off. Just to be, just to be, just to be careful. Don't, don't, don't lift up yourself like Satan did. Now, notice what the Bible says in Genesis 35. Let's, let's, let's look at this. Genesis 35, notice what the Bible says in verse 1. And I want you to understand something, that every time God's people met with God, they always took off their jewelry. Are you with me, friends? Now, you might be saying, wait a minute. The Bible says that Israelites wore jewelry. That's true. Many Israelites did wear jewelry, not because it was God's standard. They learned it from Egypt, but they still wore it. But on the Day of Atonement, on the Day of Atonement, on the Judgment Day, you all remember that day? We talked about that, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment. They all took off their jewelry when they met with God. Even the high priest himself took off his jewels. Remember that in the holy place, he had all these jewels on, the 12 stones on his chest? But when he went into the presence of God, he only had pure white on, representing that when we meet with God, we must be pure and clean. And we are living in the anti-typical day of atonement. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis 30, uh, 35. And we're going to start wrapping down, uh, winding down. Genesis uh, 35 and verse 1. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And now notice verse two, Jacob is about to go meet with God, amen? Is that what it says? He's about to go meet with God, make an altar, and notice what Jacob tells his family in verse two. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, put away the what? The strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, pardon me, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the, in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the what? The strange gods. What, what, now where were the strange gods? Is where? It was in their what? In their hand and all their what? Earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. So now notice what the Bible teaches strange gods are. It says that you wear them on your hands and you wear them in your ears. Are you with me, friends? And Jacob said, these are strange gods. Put them away. And they took off their earrings. They took off their rings. They gave them to Jacob. And Jacob hid them and buried them under a tree, representing that they were meeting with God. They were putting away the worldly things of their past. Does that make sense now, friends? And let me give you one more scripture. Go to the book of Judges. Go to the book of Judges, chapter 8. The book of Judges, what chapter are we going to? The book of Judges, chapter 8. Now, some of you may be confused. You may be saying, wait a minute, I always learned that you know, the tradition that, you know, we're supposed to wear rings when we get married and all these various things. I'm going to show you where wedding rings came from, all right? You don't mind the truth, do you? Joshua, chapter, look, I'm married. I don't have to wear a ring to show I'm married. What is a ring? How does a ring say I'm loyal to another human? What shows that I'm loyal to my wife is the vow that I made with God. Now, notice what the Bible says in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, uh, pardon me, Judges. The book of Judges, chapter 8. The book of Judges, chapter 8. And we're looking at verse 24. And when you have that, let me know by saying amen. Judges 8, 24, the Bible says this. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey. They went to battle. They killed the, 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 these people, and he wanted their earrings. Now notice this. For they had golden earrings because they were what? Ishmaelites. 
Now, were the Ishmaelites the people of God or were they heathen? So notice what the Bible says. They had earrings on, not because they were God's people. They had earrings on because they were heathen. The heathen Ishmaelites and the Egyptians were known for wearing earrings. And when you read the rest of this, this chapter, when you read verse 25 and 26, the Ishmaelites, they put jewelry on their camels, they put rings on, ear, all these various extravagant fashions. Now, friends, I believe that these things are not to be in the church of God. The Bible says again, in like manner, very clear, New Testament. New Testament. How many of our, us are New Testament Christians? Are we under the New Covenant? Amen. So what does the new covenant teach? Here's the new covenant. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, fancy hairstyles talking about, or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And you may want to write down one more scripture in the New Testament. There's another scripture in the New Testament that says that we should not wear jewelry. That's 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 1 through 4. And says the same thing. Women, don't wear gold, pearls, and jewelry in costume. 1 Peter 3, 1 to 4. And you can read that on your own time. Now, look up on the screen. Let me show you now where all this fashion came from. The occult influence has come into Christianity. And if you're honest, friends, we know that in Christianity now, it seems like in all these televangelists, the women like to wear lots of jewelry and makeup, all sorts of things where they preach. And here's Tammy Faye Baker. How many of you remember that one? Tammy Faye. Here she is. And she looks like a clown. And I'm not trying to be mean, but look at this, friends. Look how much makeup this woman has. Look how many ring, rings she has on. Look how many bracelets. And do you remember, what did they get in trouble for? For embezzlement. It was money. You remember that? Oftentimes, jewels and money are more important to Christians than the Christian gospel itself. And friends, I don't believe that we should look like this guy right here. <laughs> All right. I, I had to throw that on there because it was so shocking. And we look at it, friends. This is... Sorry, I, I, I couldn't resist putting that on there. Let's move on. Two women, friends. An impure woman with gold and jewels, and there's the pure woman, the pure church, dressed with no jewels but the righteousness, the beautiful robe of Christ's righteousness. Friends, we look at Babylon the harlot. Babylon the harlot, she's wearing gold and precious stones and pearls. The true church is not. She doesn't have gold or precious stones or pearls. Isn't that very interesting? As we continue on now, people say, well, what about my wedding ring. What about my wedding ring? Now I want to say something. I'm, I'm wrapping up now. I want to give some, I want to actually, uh, this may embarrass somebody, but I, I hope that this person doesn't mind that uh, I, I share a testimony. Is that okay? As I'm staring at you. Can I share a testimony of what you did at, at your house last a couple weeks ago? Is it okay? All right, good. I'm going to share a testimony about Sister Chrysalyn back there. Chrysalyn and her fiance Jason are being baptized today. Amen? The reason why is because they're ready. And the reason, had, I'll tell you the way I can tell people are ready is when they're willing to give up anything that stands between them and God. And Jason began saying, you know what? I've been studying my Bible. I gave up smoking and I gave up my music and this and on and on. And he's been striving and, and, and pressing for the kingdom of God. And it's, and it's rough, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard. But Jason hasn't been quitting. He's been continuing to go forward. Chrysalyn, when I came over to study, and I studied with both of them and making sure they were prepared for baptism, and they understood the doctrines, and they understood all these various things, and then came the hardest part for many, many people, and I said, well, I have to talk to you about jewelry before baptism. I, I have to, because that's what the Bible teaches, and I have to be a faithful pastor. I, I know it's difficult, and I said, and Chrysalyn was, <clears throat> pardon me, was wearing an earring, and she had, you know, she, and you write your testimony. You used to wear all sorts of bracelets all up your arms, right? And all sorts of earrings down your ears and all sorts of rings on all your fingers, didn't you? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm using this as a testimony. Don't be embarrassed. And I said, Chrysalyn, I have to share with you what the Bible teaches. And I opened the Bible and I said, and we prayed and, and we looked at what the New Testament teaches, what the Bible teaches about jewelry. And she began to weep and to cry. And then she got up and she did something that not everybody will do because not everybody has the Christian courage like she did. And she got up, and I didn't know what she was doing. She disappeared. <laughs> I thought, oh man, maybe she's, maybe she's offended. Oh, Lord. Sometimes, you know, it, you have to pray for your pastors because oftentimes ministers can be tempted to want to lower the standards to be able to recommend the gospel to people. It's, it, it's very tempting to say, look, you know, we don't have to be that strict because Jesus loves you. Come on, we want to be part of the church. It's easy to do that. I struggle. I have to pray for strength every time I speak. Say, Lord, please give me the courage to be honest with the people. 
So when you sometimes get offended, don't get mad at me. Pray for me that you, God, that help me out. Pray for me that I will do my job. Amen? And she left. I said, whoa, what's she doing? Maybe she got offended. She was crying. And then she came back a few minutes later, and she came back in with a bag. And she said, here, take it. I said, what's this? She just said, take it, because if I don't give it to you right now, I, I may never do it. Just, just take it. She had gone into her room, and she had gotten all of her jewelry. I didn't say anything. She was convicted to do this on her own. She got all of the jewelry that she owned, and she put it in a bag, and she said, here, take it. Just get rid of it for me. I can't do it. And then I said, oh, Lord, she's done such a great job. But she still had a little earring in her ear. I said, oh, Lord, I don't want to be too harsh. She said, but good job. Praise the Lord. I said, but you still have something in your ear. <laughs> and she went, oh, took it out, threw it in the bag, and said, take it. And I'll tell you what, friends, my respect level went up for this couple. As they began preparing for baptism, then Jason moved out of his house. They have three children together, but they recognize that we want to be baptized and do it the right way. This man moved out of his house, living separately until they can be married. She got rid of all of her jewelry, and then it came the wedding time. And we said, well, what about the wedding ring? And you were raised Catholic, weren't you? And Chrislyn, your family. Okay, some people, so who said, somebody said they were a recovering Catholic the other day. Okay, amen. And in the Catholic Church, rings are a very, very big deal. And as we talked about marriage, they began asking, what do we do? And I said, well, I, I, can't, I can't recommend that you get a wedding ring because the Bible says that, you know, we had that screen up that we can't have gold and pearls and jewelry. And you know what? They had the Christian courage to say, you know what? A ring is not important. Our promise to God and between each other is more important than that. Now, I want to show you where the, the, where the wedding ring came from, okay? The wedding ring came from paganism. Now, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to just tell you that. I'm going to tell you what the Catholic Church itself tells you, that the wedding ring came into the Catholic Church because of pagan traditions, all right? Let me just put this. This is our last section. Uh, my Bible's closed. I'm just going to put on these last few screens. Cardinal Newman, this is from J.H. Newman, an essay on the development of Christian doctrine, or Catholic doctrine, really. Page 373, coming from a book called Bible Readings from the Home, page 217. <laughs> Cardinal Newman lists many examples of things admittedly of, what's that? Pagan origin. Now, how many of us want to have pagan practices in our lives? Don't we, don't we, aren't we excited about being pagans? None of us desire to be pagans, do we? As Seventh-day Adventists, we are the church that is to continue and to complete the Protestant Reformation. Here is pagan origin, which that church, the Catholic Church, introduced in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen. Here it is. The use of temples, and these dedicated to particular saints. Is that paganism? Worshiping saints? Yes. Ornamented on occasion with branches of trees, incense, lamps, and candles, votive offerings on recovery from illness, holy water. Are these all things pagan? Okay, we all agree. Asylums, holy days and seasons, use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure, and the what? The ring in marriage. The ring in marriage and turning to the east or worshiping the sun and the images at a later date, perhaps the ecclesiastical chant, these are all pagan in origin. So why is the ring in marriage pagan? The ring in marriage represents fertility worship. The ring represents the female. The finger represents the male. And Catholics have different, different traditions. Some of them put it on three fingers. And they go, one, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And in Christian churches today, they still put it on the finger. That represents the union of the male phallic symbol with the female, female reproductive parts. And it is a pagan symbol that blesses the fertility in the marriage. It also symbolizes slavery. Slaves in the Old Testament would also wear rings. And also represents being married to the sun god. The circle represents the sun god. And you'll notice that priests who aren't married... Celibate priests still wear rings, don't they? Because they are married to their God, to the sun God. This is where it came from. I don't, if you don't like it, don't take it up with me. Take it up with the Catholic Church. They're the ones who say that the ring in marriage is pagan. Well, it's not, it's not pagan for me. It represents love. Friends, that's what people say about Sunday. Sunday represents my worship of Jesus. Is that an excuse? You have to go back to what the Bible teaches. Amen? And rings are pagan in origin. Seventh-day Adventists historically have never allowed wedding rings 
in the church. It was, has only been recently because of the compromise of the general conference structure put in the church manual because of missionary work. Because there were people in missionary countries who might get killed or women raped because they didn't have a ring. So the general conference said, look, so that these women won't get raped in their country, we'll allow them to have a ring. And then the Americans said, well, great, let's all put it on. And then rings came in and then earrings and then necklaces. And now our church looks like any other church. But let me show you what this woman says right here. I believe that this woman was inspired of the Lord. And in the book, Testimonies to Ministers, page 180, some have had a burden in regard to the wearing of a marriage ring, feeling that the wives of our ministers should conform to this custom. All this is unnecessary. Let the minister's wives have the golden link which binds their souls to Jesus Christ. A pure and holy character, the true love and meekness and godliness that are the fruit born upon the Christian tree and their influence will be secure anywhere. Notice what she says about the marriage ring. The fact that a disregard of the custom occasions remark is no good reason for adopting it. Americans can make their position understood by plainly stating that the custom is not regarded as obligatory in our country. We need not wear the what? The sign. What sign? It's a sign of paganism. For we are not untrue to our marriage vow, and the wearing of the ring would be no evidence that we were true. Isn't that true? Does a, does a ring around your finger keep you true to your husband or wife? No, matter of fact, some women like to prey upon men with rings because it represents more stability. Yeah, matter of fact, there have been talk shows out there. Women, you know, they sit out there with this, this, you know, this pride, smug look on their face. I hunt down married men. And same thing, men look at married women. And it, a ring has no way of keeping you safe. Only the God of heaven can keep you true to your marriage vow. I feel deeply over this leavening process which seems to be going on among us in the conformity to custom and fashion. Not one penny should be spent for a circlet of gold to testify that we are married. Not one penny. If you have a problem with me, friends, go take it up with the Catholic Church and take it up with Ellen White. This is, and this is, this is it. I already talked to you about this, friends. On the Day of Atonement, the Israelites, yes, they wore jewelry, but on the Day of Atonement, they took it off. When they were in the holy place, the high priest wore jewels, didn't he? Here he is in the holy place. He's wearing jewels, but in the most holy place, he took it off. And friends, I believe that we are living, that's my last slide, I believe that we are living in the day of atonement going on in heaven. Jesus is cleansing his people from sin. Amen? Is Jesus wanting to forgive us of our sins? Then we ought to get our lives right with God. Amen? And friends, let me tell you something. Even though you may not agree or may you be, maybe be uncomfortable, God's standards do not change just because we don't like his standards. God's standards are God's standards. God does not change because God cannot change. We are to change. And we are to get our lives in conformity with God's will. And so if we have a problem, then we, not, we don't need to fight against it. And I tell you, friends, it is a sign of unconversion. When people stand up and they want to fight this stuff. Don't fight it. Get on your knees and fight with your own heart and say, Lord, help me to surrender. Don't fight with the minister and fight with the Bible and fight with the spirit of prophecy. Fight with your own heart and say, Lord, I need victory. Amen? God, give me victory. I feel uncomfortable. Maybe I feel like I'm not pretty. Maybe, but that's, that's something that's in our hearts. And friends, I believe that God needs the standards to come up higher in the Christian church. We are about to see a time of trouble such as never been. I'm going to tell you something, friends. All these things that we're holding on to are one day going to burn up. My closing scripture as we pray. The Gospel of Luke. Just came to my mind. My closing scripture as we pray. Please turn to the Gospel of Luke, friends. Chapter 12. I believe that we need to get our hearts and lives right with Jesus. Amen? And I believe, friends, that God is calling our church to have a higher standard than the world. And in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 12, I want to just... Leave with the promise and an encouragement that Jesus says. Luke chapter 12, people say, oh, I can't get rid of these things. These things have sentimental value. These things have, uh, let me just tell you this. By the way, you need to be careful that you're not a stumbling block to your spouse. I'll never forget, years ago, and there was a man that was baptized. He came in, and he was convicted. He said, I, don't, I want to be totally right with God, and he learned about the marriage ring. And he said, you know what? I'm just going to take it off because, you know, I love my wife. This, I can love my wife without this thing. I just don't want to wear jewelry. So he took it off, and his wife 
threatened to leave him after he was baptized unless he put that thing back on. Obviously, in the wife's heart, the ring had no value about marriage. The ring was about control. Because he said, I love you. We have five children. He had five daughters. I, and this man was serious about God. I personally did Bible studies with him. Over the, this was years ago, maybe about seven years ago. And this woman, who was also raised a Catholic, by the way, and she sat up and she looked at her husband and said, if you don't put that thing back on, I'm going to leave you. And this man bowed down and put that thing back on and he left the church over a piece of gold. And to this day, he's forsaken, not just the church, he's forsaken Jesus. He's out there in the world. He's miserable. I went and visited him. Matter of fact, we went down back in California, my wife and I, we passed a church and I went back six years, five years, six years later and I knocked on his door just to see how he was doing, see how his wife was doing. And his wife was at the door and I said, hey, hey, how you doing, Maria? And we talked and we prayed together and she told me about how this man, he was miserable, their marriage was falling apart. I said, well, let's pray together. And she began to weep about the, in, the lack of harmony in their marriage all because she wanted to stand up for a piece of gold and their marriage became destroyed anyway. Is jewelry that important to destroy our marriages? To destroy our relationship with God? Luke chapter 12 and verse 29 to 34. Let's prepare to pray. And Jesus says, and seek not. Are we all there, amen? Father, please pour out your spirit and please help us, Lord, to make the decisions that we need to make to be pure Christians. And whatever may separate us from God, may we be willing to surrender to, to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. And seek not what ye, seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Friends, it's high time that we lay up treasure, not on our bodies. It's high time that we begin to lay up treasure in heaven, for Jesus is soon to come. Amen? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed, we thank you for the lessons that you have been teaching us. I thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, perhaps there are people here today that are convicted that they need to be able to obey the full counsel of God to walk in all the light of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and be an example in the church, not a stumbling block. And there may be some here that are tempted to say, well, I'm not a church member, I'm not a church leader, and therefore I'm not a stumbling block. If you name yourself my brother or sister, if you claim to be a Christian and you are not living up to the standards, then you can become a stumbling block to somebody else. And so as your heads are bowed and as your eyes are closed, today... We're having a baptism. And the Bible teaches that as people are baptized in the watery grave, their sins are washed away and they're clean. Their old lives are left behind and they can walk in newness of life. And last night there was an appeal for those who desire to be a part of the commandment keeping people of God, to keep the Sabbath and to be able to go to heaven with Jesus. And many people came forward and today are continued appeal as your heads are bowed and as your eyes are closed and as God's spirit is present and as holy angels are present the appeal today is for those of you who are desiring to walk with the Lord all the way and to say dear God I recognize that perhaps I've slidden back and I want to walk in all the truth that I've been learning and today you can be baptized there may be some others here who have never joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church and they're desiring to say, Lord, I want to be a part of your people. I've learned so much. I've, my heart has been changed. I want to walk with God. Obviously, the Bible has been making sense and I want to be 
I want to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I want to walk with you. I want to be part of your remnant church. And if that's your desire, the baptismal font is also for you. There have also been people who have never been baptized formerly in the Seventh-day Adventist church. They've, you've been coming to the church for years, but have never been baptized, and you're saying, Lord, I want to join through baptism. And if that is any of you in this room, then at this time I'm going to invite you to come forward as we prepare to have our baptismal service in just a little while. And you're saying, Lord, I want to join Christ afresh at the water gift of baptism. I want to join the Adventist church. I want to be rebaptized. I want to have my sins washed away. I want to be part of your remnant church. If that is any of your prayers, I'm going to invite you to come forward at this time. For those of you who have already been preparing for baptism, you can come forward at this time for special prayer as every head is bowed and every eye is closed. There should be several people moving forward. And the rest of us are praying. Heavenly Father, bless the people and help them to come forward and make the decision to walk with Christ and to be part of your remnant church. In Jesus' name. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. There are people walking forward, amen, who are preparing and desiring for baptism. Praise the Lord. There are maybe others in this room as well that, again, have been convicted that they have been walking in such a way that they feel they need to be rebaptized and reconsecrated to the Lord, putting things away out of their lives. There are three different reasons for baptism. One is if you've never been biblically baptized the correct way. Bapti baptism teaches it is not by sprinkling, it is not by pouring, but you must be immersed under the water. It symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. If, you never, if you've never been baptized biblically by, by immersion, by going all the way under the water, then you may desire to be baptized the biblical way, and you can come forward at this time. The second reason for baptism are for those that have understood the truth, but they have fallen away, or they have had compromises in their lives, and they recognize that they've been walking apart from God, and they want to be rebaptized, that is, reconsecrated to the Lord. And if that is your desire, you can come forward at this time to join those who are kneeling up front. You may say, I want to be reconsecrated to God. I want to be reburied in the watery grave and have my sins washed away. If that's your desire, then you can come forward at this time. And the third reason is for those who have been baptized already in other churches. You've already been baptized by water immersion. You haven't been backsliding or compromising, but you've been learning new truth. Perhaps you've never been part of this church before, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the Bible teaches in the book of Acts that Paul found people that were baptized by John the Baptist. But they, had, they learned more truth about Jesus, and when they learned more truth, they were rebaptized as a part of consecrating their lives to Jesus afresh. And if that is your desire to be rebaptized, and I'm going to ask you as well to come forward at this time. Our Heavenly Father, I ask and pray that you would help people to make the decisions that are necessary, and that you would pour your Spirit out upon us, and that you would bless us in these services. Be with us now as our prayer, as we have our final appeal. And now as I prepare to kneel myself and pray, this is my final appeal, if anyone would like to come forward again to be part of of the baptismal service, to say, Lord, I want to be part of your remnant people of God. At this time, move forward, please, as we prepare to have a closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for those who have come forward. I kneel on my knees with them, praying that your Holy Spirit would be poured out upon them. I pray that you would strengthen them and convert them and convict them and give them strength to walk with Jesus the rest of their life. I pray for those that are going to be newly baptized afresh in the church, which are several people here. I pray that your spirit will come upon them. For those that perhaps have already been Seventh-day Adventists but have never been officially baptized or maybe it was long ago and they want to reconsecrate their lives today, I pray that you would bless them as well. And finally, Lord, please be with those in the congregation. Perhaps there are still some seated here today that sense the conviction in their heart to, to walk with you and to be reconsecrated. I pray that you would strive with them and help them not to have rest or peace until they are surrendered fully to the Lord. Bless us now as our prayer and be with us during our service. We thank you so much. Pour out your spirit upon us and may your angels be with us in our service. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen.